Luke chapter 22 is where we're at this morning, beginning in verse 15. Luke 22. Now, as I look around, I I would normally be hesitant to ask this question because I would already know the answer. But how many of you here were born after 1969? After 1960, oh, get, get your hand down, Doris. I didn't say 1869, 1969. So let me see those hands again. Uh, 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 19, yeah, you too. And over here is a, is a group of them. Will you get Gabrielle's hand up? She was born after. His hands were raised, live in a world where man has always walked on the moon. You realize that? The rest of us, we can at least acknowledge that man has walked on the moon in our lifetime. And some of you probably remember that day pretty well, don't you? You all watch that? You know, when it was happening and all of that? Yeah, pretty exciting. People, even if you watch the video today... Most people realize that minute before they were in a point of crisis. For as they skirted along the lunar surface and were, were a minute from touchdown, all of a sudden you hear Charlie Duke, who was Capcom, say, 1201 alarm. And most of us just miss that. We don't need, we, we don't even think anything about it. And, and Charlie waits a little bit. He says, We're go on that, we're go on that. And and then a few minutes later you hear you hear Buzz say, Twelve oh two alarm. And and they're waiting, they're waiting, and then Charlie Duke comes back and says, We're go on that one too, we're go on that one too. And that's what said, And we forget about twelve oh one and twelve oh two alarms. What it was was the computer was telling them I'm in trouble, and I, I'm not quite sure what's going on. And if they couldn't resolve that issue, then Neil and Buzz would need to hit an abort button and separate and make it back to orbit. So it was very critical that they defined what those 1201 and 1202 alarms were, and they figured out not so much what they were at the time, but that they weren't critical. That's why Charlie told them we're went back through and they tried to figure out why they had these alarms and what they found out was that the primitive computers that they had at that time very primitive those of you that are wearing a digital watch you have more computing power in your watch than they had on the lunar module um, the primitive computers that they were using were overloaded and that they were dumping that they weren't able to do. And they were that's what you're telling, we just can't handle all this. Well, they said, well, why was the computer overloaded? Well, what they found out was that Buzz had failed to flip a switch. They had two radars on the lunar module, one for landing and one for rendezvous. And, and Buzz thought, you know what, I'm going to be a pretty sharp guy. I'm going to keep the rendezvous radar on just in case we have a problem so that I don't have to turn it on. So you're getting the radar returns from the one going up, and you're getting the radar returns from the one coming from the ground, and the computer's confused. It's saying, I'm getting contradictory information. It's kind of losing its mind. It's a little bipolar. Okay? And so it's sending out an alert. Well, what's that got to do with a whole lot of anything? You are just like that computer. At least a lot of people are. Maybe you're not. But a lot of people kind of come into a walk with the Lord and there's two things that they listen to. Okay? They listen to this one and I won't tell you yet what it is. I'll keep you wondering. And they think that's what life's all about. And that's how we do this Christian thing. And then they hear this other one and they go, well, that's what life's about and that's how we do this Christian thing. And these contradictory messages and inside ourselves we get all confused trying to, trying to recon reconcile them with one another. And we go, oh my gosh, what's going on? And God in his loving voice whispers down and says, flip the switch. <laughs> you know, I think it would have been embarrassing if 
for all posterity. We had this recording where Charlie Duke says to Buzz, flip the switch. <laughs> you messed up. Well, I want you to know that a lot of people when it comes to a relationship with God have messed up. Because somehow we think, somehow we have it in our notion that on one hand, God in his great sovereignty has given a sacrifice for humanity. And that that sacrifice atones for sin and opens up the way to a relationship with God. And that's what we commemorate this morning in the Lord's Supper. That God in his great love said, you know what? Mankind, humanity are sinners. And they need to be saved. They need to be rescued from the price of their sin. And so he provides the perfect sacrifice. And we hallelujah, raise our hands, praise the Lord. So thankful for what God has done. That is one radar return. But on the other hand, we say, I still have an obligation to follow the law. I still have to earn God's favor. I still have to work to please him and to appease him. I still need to do the best that I can do in order for God not to give me that which I deserve. And that's the other radar return. Do you understand how diametrically opposed those are to one another? Can you imagine if somebody were to come up to you on your birthday and hand you a gift and say, here, I know you want this forever. And you receive that gift with joy in your heart. And then you think, I need to pay them back for this. I need to somehow compensate them for the gift that they've given me. I, I, I need to go and earn this gift. And so you spend the next year trying to earn that gift which that person has given to you free and clear and the whole year that person kind of looks at you going you don't get it it's a gift in the book of Luke Luke is the only one of the gospel writers who records the last supper and who picks up on this contradiction and points out how that Jesus addressed it. Matthew and Mark record Jesus' participation of the Last Supper. But they only record the New Covenant. Only Luke talks about God doing away with the Old Covenant. Read with me if you would please beginning in verse 15 through verse 20. Listen to what it says. And Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and had given thanks, he said, Take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he said to them, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after he had eaten, saying, This cup is is this cup which is poured out for you is the covenant of my blood. Jesus took the bread and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Anybody never heard that phrase before? I mean, I think we're probably if you've ever sat through a Lord's Supper or a communion service. You've probably heard that. And you go, okay, Jesus took the bread and he talked about, you know, his sacrifice. Okay, good deal. I'm glad you recognize that. And then he took the cup, the cup of wine. Make all you Baptists nervous. It was wine. It was wine. It wasn't grape juice. It wasn't Welch's. It was wine. Okay. Why wasn't it grape juice? Because they didn't have grape juice. Okay. And he said, this cup here is the new covenant. You notice that? Where it says that? You see that? Right? You see it? If you see it, raise your hand. If you don't see it, raise your hand. If you're not, Luke can raise both. Okay. He said, this cup is the new covenant 
in my blood. And this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus is sitting there with his disciples the midst of an Old Testament feast, the feast of Passover, that was part of the law where the Israelites were commanded that at every year they were to remember this, to remember how God had delivered them. In fulfillment of the law, he takes that bread and he says to them, I want you to be aware that this is my body which is given for you. Now, not being from a sacrificial system, we miss something here. The law required, the Old Testament law required that every day, every week, every month, every year that the Jews would bring a sacrifice for their sins. If they violated a commandment, they were supposed to go and offer a sacrifice. If they had done this, they were supposed to go and offer a sacrifice. If they did that, they were supposed to come and offer a sacrifice. That was a part of their worship. For in doing so, God was teaching to them the fact that you are a sinner and that sin has prices. So, so, so sacrifice was a very big part of the worship of the nation of Israel. They needed to understand, you're a sinner and sin needs to be paid for. But it never was God's intent. Never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever... God's intent. That through the sacrifices of lambs or bulls or doves or whatever, it never was God's intent that that sacrifice would atone for the sin of the person. Remove it. Eradicate it. It couldn't. The life of a bull is nothing in comparison to the life of a person. It was never God's intent it was never in his mind that in, 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 in offering sin, or offering a sacrifice, that sin was now removed. It was always in God's mind that in having them do this, he wanted them to understand that sin did have a price. In offering that sacrifice, he wanted to, them to understand that, that something needed to be done for sin. Sin isn't just a minor issue, it's a major issue. He wanted them to begin to understand as they dealt with the issue of the law that they just weren't capable of fulfilling the law. You know, sometimes when we look at the, the Old Testament and we look at the commandments, we, we make a big deal about saying, boy, if I could just do them. And you need, to, you need to do this and you need to do that. I want you to understand. Do all that you can. You're never going to, de you're never going to be able to do all that you need to do. So Jesus stood there before his disciples that night and he said to them, People laden, birthed, raised in a worship culture of sacrifice. He says to them, I am your sacrifice. I am your sacrifice. This is my body which is given for you. In that statement, Jesus told them, this is the atonement. Me. Not just a covering for sin but an atoning for sin. In doing that, Jesus was looking at them and saying, a perfect sacrifice for humanity has been offered. For when Christ died, it was God in the flesh coming in who had never sinned, who had never transgressed the law, who had never done anything wrong. He was the perfect sacrifice for not just your sins, but my sins, the sin of everyone that's ever lived, and everyone that ever will live. When you hold that bread, you're remembering my sacrifice. And then he says this, and this is the part that's hard for us to really grasp. The old covenant is fulfilled. The law is satisfied. You think, you think it was just a random statement that as Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, It is 
finished. It's done. We're through. That was the cry of the priests on the Day of Atonement as the sacrifices were made and they were finished. The priests would cry out, It's done. We're over. We're through. It's finished. So Jesus in that, in that moment says to his disciples, the law has been satisfied. It's over. The law has been fulfilled. It's done. Isn't that wonderful? What you could never do, Jesus did. You could never keep the law. I could never keep the law. But Jesus did. I can never be perfect. You can never be perfect. But Jesus was. I can never atone for my sin. Let alone the sin of anyone, anyone else. But Jesus could. So what we were unable to do. What humanity has been incapable of accomplishing. Jesus took care of. And then he looks at us and says. It's done. Good news huh? Listen to what the writer of Hebrews said to a bunch of Hebrew believers on this very topic. He said, with his own blood, Jesus, not with the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow cleansed people's body from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God for by the power of the eternal spirit Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins that is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and his people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them for Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sin they had committed under that first covenant. Ladies and gentlemen, the law has been fulfilled. Stop going there. Stop going to God and saying, if I can just this, if I can just that, if I can keep eight out of the ten, seven out of the ten, if I could just, you know, somehow find a way to be good enough, God will be satisfied. Stop it. You can't. And you don't need to. Because Jesus said, this is my body, your sacrifice, the law has been satisfied. Well then, woohoo! Let's go! That's one side of the equation. He lifts up a cup then and says, and this cup is the new covenant. The old one's been done away. Now there's a new covenant. It's a new covenant that is based in grace. It is a new covenant that is based in redemption. It is a new covenant centered on the person of Christ. It is a new covenant meant to be a relationship grounded in faith. Not a covenant meant to be, to be worked out through works. For by grace, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, you have been saved by faith and not of works. When you and I lift up the scriptures and we, we look into the law and we so want to live that law and we think that somehow that is the way to live, to have peace with God, we're listening to one radar return while God's giving another one and we get confused. It was never, ever, ever, never, ever, 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 never God's intent for humanity to be redeemed by the law. Never. The purpose of the law was very simple. The purpose of the law was to identify sin, to say what was sin. God is the one free of sin, could easily say what was sin, because you and I can't. We often call sin things that we don't like. I think that it's sinful for a person to root for the Raiders, because I don't like the Raiders. Can you possibly believe such and such? I just distaste it. That's sinful. I'm marred by sin. Like 
I'm an objective evaluator of what is sin and what isn't. I think doing drugs is a sin. You go, amen, preacher. I don't have a problem with being fat. That's not a sin. <laughs> right? Both of them are indulgence of the flesh. That's an amen from a baby. Okay? So I'm not going to call obesity chubbiness, gravitationally challenged. I'm not going to call that sin because then I'm going to be camping out in my own backyard and we don't want to do that. But God, who is free of sin, says, let me tell you what really is sin. And oftentimes, you know, what the Lord identifies as sin, it nearly is external as it is internal. You know, God's not as concerned with what you do out here as what goes on in here. So you and I go, oh, I'm going to pick on Brother Virgil because he was sick last week and he's better now. So I'm going to pick on him. Brother Virgil, you look at Brother Virgil and you go, oh, what a godly man. Oh, if I could be like Brother Virgil. Oh, the Lord must be pleased with Brother Virgil. Because all we can see is the outside. But if we were to peek into Brother Virgil's heart, we might see some things that we go, oh my, I can't believe that's there. We look at one another and we go, oh, isn't brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, aren't they so godly? And then God looks at the heart and says, well, you know what, there's some good things going on, but there's some sin going on too. If we're going to identify sin, we're going to stop here. But God who is free of sin goes right to the heart and he says, let me tell you what. And that's what the law did. The law identified sin. And then the law did this. The law revealed man's depravity. The law revealed man's depravity. Depravity is not a word that we use a whole lot. It's an old timer word. Not to offend anybody that says, hey, I know depravity. All right? Not mean to offend anybody, but we've moved on. We, we're more enlightened now. We don't use the word depravity. We ought to. Because you know what it means to be depraved? means you're a sinner. You're incapable of doing what is right. You are. You can't do what is right. I disagree with you, Pastor. Every day I do something that's right. I didn't say you couldn't do some things that are right. I'm saying that you can't be perfect. You can't keep the law. If I lock you up in a room by yourself with nothing and turn the lights off, you know what? You're going to find a way to sin. Because we're depraved. Apart from God, there is nothing good about me. Paul put it this way. He said, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Leave me alone. Take away everything that we call sin. I'll find a way to sin. Because I'm depraved. I, I see the law. God's identified the law. Told me what's wrong. And, and, and I don't want to do it. But, I do it anyway. Right? Anybody want to identify with that? Anybody want to say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a sinner. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. I get up in the morning, I make my list. I don't want to do it. And you know what? I end up sinning at the end of the day because I didn't put something on that list. <laughs> Golly, how did I not think of that? I'm depraved. So the law tells me that I, what is sin and the fact that, 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 that I'm depraved. And, and then the beautiful thing that comes out of that is since I know what sin is and I realize that I can't, I can't help but sin, I need help. And that help is Jesus. That was the purpose of the law. That's what Paul said to the church of Galatia when he goes, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the law, under the tutor. Back up. Try that again. <laughs> but now that faith has come, we're no longer under the law. Amen. There you go. That's good news. Amen. That's the good, that's why we call it the gospel. Is the fact that you and I, who think in our minds that somehow to be right with God we need to keep the law but we inherently know 
that we can't have been given know that we don't need to because Jesus already did and that I can be right with God not by the old covenant but I can be right with God because of him you all know this truth have you ever been brought into a group maybe it's Kiwanis or the lions or the elks or And you're brought in by somebody who is in the group and who is a friend of yours. Anybody ever been there? Okay. I want you to join our group and I will be your vehicle into the group. Because I know you and I can recommend you to this group. They will accept you. And so you come into the group through this person who will say for the sake of argument is a door. Is that a relationship with God which you cannot achieve by works is made possible through the door of Christ's sacrifice. What you cannot earn, what you are incapable of earning, God has made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus. So no longer must you stand outside and bang at the door and scream at the windows and say, let me in, let me in, let me in. Now Christ, by trusting Him, becomes the vehicle through which you enter into a relationship with God. And that's the new covenant. Jesus said, this is my blood, which is the new covenant. Do you understand the tension? That we walk into a relationship with God and we think, I need to do in order to be right. And we try to live that. And the Spirit of God says, no, you can't do. You just need to be. And so we get these two signals, trying to keep the law but yet knowing we need to walk in faith and we get confused and we start going 1201 1202 flip the switch the law has been fulfilled the law has been fulfilled you couldn't keep it to begin with but in a few moments when you hold that bread in your hand you're going to be reminded that Jesus who could fulfill it did fulfill it And then said, it's done. So now you can rest. And the book of Hebrews talks about Shabbat and the the whole idea of Sabbath rest in that light. I can now rest. I don't have to keep the law. I can't keep the law. And then you're going to hold in your hand a cup of grape juice. Why don't we use wine, preacher? Doesn't matter what it is. Matters what we're talking about. And you're going to look at that and say, because he died, he provided a new way. Maybe I need to live that way. And you're going to drink that grape juice. You're going to taste that sweetness. And hopefully it reminds you that the way of faith is a whole lot better than the way of the law. Those are going to help me with the Lord's Supper. If you'll come forward, please. I'm going to ask the rest of you to bow your heads, close your eyes, just to wait with me before God. The only condition the Bible places for participation in the Lord's Supper is that a person be a believer in Christ. And what I mean by that is that they have ceased, they have ceased from their trying they have ceased trying to be right with God based on their efforts and have come in faith to Jesus and said I can't do it forgive me forever trying I cast myself upon your love and mercy to make me right with God we surrender our life to him that's the only condition for observing the Lord for participating in the Lord's Supper If you've never done that, you can't commemorate something you've never experienced. 
So if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, if you've never yielded your life to Him, you have the opportunity right now to admit to that reality, to stop laboring after trying to earn your way, and to receive simply His love and His sacrifice. You have that opportunity right now. So I ask you to consider. I ask you to think about that. Are you trying to earn your way in? Or are you willing to just rest in what Jesus has done for you? Father, there's somebody here who is still of their own efforts and in their own power trying to somehow please you. Trying to somehow earn their, their way to keep the rules and to keep the law. Father, in the way only that you can do, I ask you to please burden their heart with the futility of their actions. Help them even right now, Father, to realize that all they need to do is trust you. And if you're here today and you've made that decision, and you've trusted Christ, I would almost bet money that even though you have accepted him in faith that you try to walk in the flesh to do the godly things because you still think somehow you need to earn God's favor you need to stop doing that you cannot commemorate this meal, you cannot celebrate his sacrifice if you're, if you're saying to God I appreciate what he did for me but I'm still going to try to earn it anyway When you lift that bread, you're telling him, he's done it all. And when you lift that cup, you're declaring to him, and it's because of that, that I can enjoy life. If you don't admit to that, it's hard for you to truly appreciate the Lord's son. So Father, all of us who, who have yielded our life to you, come in confession of idolatry, Lord, really. I'm confessing to you that more times than we're comfortable, we, we try to do for ourselves what we can't do. We put our efforts ahead of the wonderful offering to Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. And, Father, in a, in a new way, even if it's just a slimmer of sunlight, begin to see that we're called to walk in a restful relationship trusting what you have done and only what you have done this all we ask because of Christ Amen